You know, one of the common themes that we find all throughout the New Testament is this concept of fruit bearing. In fact, it was so important to the Christian life that Jesus spent some of his last moments before his crucifixion speaking to this concept to his apostles in John chapter 15. You start reading in verse 5, and Jesus makes one of those great I am statements that he only made in the book of John when he simply said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. But then he says, for without me or apart from me, you can do nothing. In fact, an identifying marker of a disciple of Christ, according to Jesus, is one who bears much fruit. Drop down three verses there to John chapter 15 and verse 8, and Jesus makes this statement. By this my Father is glorified. By what, Jesus? That you bear much fruit. And then he concludes and says, so you will be my disciples. In other words, we are disciples of Christ if we bear much fruit. And by the fruit that we bear, our Father is glorified. In fact, the, that we have in Christ Jesus, in Ephesians 1 verse 3, are contingent on how much fruit we bear as New Testament Christians. We have the fruit of our sanctification, the Apostle Paul would write, whose end is eternal life, Romans chapter 6, verse 22. So in this Sunday evening sermon series that's going to last nine Sunday evenings, we are simply exploring the fruit of the Spirit and the nine Christian graces that fall under the umbrella of the fruit of the Spirit. And as we discussed last week, it's very interesting that the fruit of the Spirit is singular, whereas the works of the flesh are referred to as plural. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit is singular in that it's singular in its purpose, and we must demonstrate all nine characteristics in our life if we are to be led by the Spirit. You know, I once remember a man who had every reason, more than anyone ever, to be miserable. But none was more joyful. His first home was a palace. His name was loved. His name was respected. He had everything. He had wealth. He had power. He had reverence. But then he had nothing. Students of the event still study it. Historians still try to explain the conundrum about how a king who had everything would go and choose to have nothing. His palace grounds were spotless, but then he was exposed to filth. In his kingdom, he was revered, but when he was on this earth, some ridiculed him, some called him a lunatic, some thought he was a sideshow. And those who didn't ridicule him wanted a taste of the amazing. They wanted him to do favors. They wanted him to do amazing feats. They wanted to do all kinds of these wonderful, amazing things. That is, until it was out of fashion, and then they wanted to kill him. They falsely accused him. They hired false witnesses to lie about him. The jury was rigged against him and no lawyer would be assigned to defend him. A judge that was swayed by politics issued a death sentence for him and he left as he came penniless. But none was more joyful. He was joyful in his poverty. He was joyful when he was abandoned. He was joyful when he was betrayed. He was joyful when he was crucified. Jesus was the greatest embodiment of joy that we've ever seen on this earth. Yes, Jesus was the embodiment of Christian love. But can you find a better example within all the Bible of a man who embodied Christian joy? One of the nine graces that we're going to discuss this evening is joy. It's the second listed in the list of Paul in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 and 23. In fact, it's listed secondly right after love that is listed firstly. In other words, if I'm going to have love, that also means that I must have a joy as a New Testament Christian. And joy is one of the nine Christian graces that falls under the fruit of the Spirit. In fact, when you look throughout the New Testament, you're going to see an amazing relationship that exists between the Holy Spirit and between joy. If you turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 14 and to verse 17, Paul, he's talking about all these evil things, all these things that they had formerly done. And then he talks about the law of love and he contrasts evil things compared to the kingdom of God. These evil things were depraved, these evil things were horrible, but then you had the kingdom of God. And he says the kingdom of God is classified by peace, righteousness. But don't miss it. 
joy in the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, there in verse 6, Paul talks to these brethren that he had visited. He writes to them and he says, I commend you for receiving the word of God, here it is again, with joy of the Holy Spirit. And then obviously when you go to Galatians chapter 5 and you start there in verse 22, the second Christian grace that is listed after the first in the umbrella of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. If I'm going to have love as a Christian, that means I must have joy as a Christian. When you look at the Greek root word for joy, we recognize that it is kara. It's spelled C-H-A-R-A. Now when you look at the definition of this, Thayer defines it as joy or gladness. And then Vines comes in and throws in the word delight. In fact, it's found over 60 times within the New Testament because if you look at that Greek root word, kara, when you add the verb form of it, it's karen. And that is oftentimes translated in the New Testament as the word rejoice. You go over in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12 and you read verse 15 and you remember that the apostle Paul said, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Paul might as well have said, be joyful with those who are joyful and weep with those who who weep. In fact, if you're familiar with the root word for grace, that word is charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. And they are a similar root word. So when we're talking about unmerited favor, which is grace, we have never done anything in our life to merit the joy that we have as New Testament Christians in Christ Jesus. In fact, there's a great relationship that exists between grace and joy. In the Bible. In fact, our joy is completely contingent upon and directly proportional to the grace that we have received, or at least the perceived grace that we have received. I remember when I was a child, I would receive gifts for various special occasions, and sometimes those gifts would be small, and sometimes those gifts would be large. And I guess it's just human nature that when we receive those gifts, if they're small, we're joyful, we're thankful, but we're of a less joyful than if we receive a larger gift. If I've received a very large gift of grace, unmerited favor, something that's been bestowed upon me that I did not deserve nor did anything in my life to warrant, then I am going to be mighty joyful. But I want you to remember this. If Christians don't have joy, there's something wrong. If Christians' lives are not filled to the brim with joy, then we've got a leak somewhere in our lives. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 8 that this joy that we have as New Testament Christians is one, inexpressible. Now if something is inexpressible, that means it cannot be expressed in gratitude using words. Peter says it's inexpressible and full of glory, but that glory doesn't come from us. That glory comes from the Father. The joy that we have is inexpressible. We can't explain it in words, but that is also filled with glory from the Father. It's so much better than the passing pleasures of sin, Hebrews 11 verse 25. It's so much better than the vanity that Solomon speaks about in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, starting in verse 10. In fact, the joy that we have as New Testament Christians, it's made possible by these words of Paul in Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 4. He says, rejoice, be joyful in the Lord always. Which also means that that joy, that rejoicing can only be found in the Lord. You know, oftentimes I see Christians that don't seem as if they have an ounce of joy in a single bone in their body. They'll make statements like, well, I just don't have the joy that I used to have. I just don't feel joyful anymore. And I believe that if we have a leak of joy in our life, it's because of one of three things. A failure to act, a failure to understand, or a failure to remember. The concept of joy and the joy that we ought to have in our lives as New Testament Christians, the degree of joy that ought to be measured out to others through our lives as Christians. In fact, in the remainder of this lesson, I simply want to look with you at five separate sources of joy that we have in our lives as New Testament Christians. Because if there's a leak of joy in your life, it may be because you're failing or failing to remember in one of these five sources of joy. 
You know, faith is a source of joy. In fact, faith is the very source of joy upon which our joy as Christians is built upon. Paul was talking about living for Christ and dying in gain in Philippians chapter 1. He's talking to these brethren about this concept about how it would be good for him to live for them, but for him to die would also be gain because he knew that he was going to be with Christ. Paul said that I'm betwixt between two straits, whether I should depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But then Paul took the concept of joy and he threw it into this illustration that he's using to these brethren in Philippi. And he said in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 25, I shall continue with you for your progress, now don't miss it, and joy of faith. Without faith in God, without faith in Christ Jesus, we cannot experience abiding joy because that abiding joy is found nowhere else than in Christ Jesus. You know, Jesus once talked about the primary detractor from the joy that we have in our lives as Christians, and it came in the form of one word. Jesus said it's worry. In Matthew chapter 6, he said, don't worry about what you're going to drink. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about shelter or putting a roof over your head. And then he goes on down and he says, don't you know, the heavenly father knows that you need all things. But what's the key to having these things added to your life? You know this verse just as much as I do. Verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If your life is leaking joy, it might be because you're not becoming the person that God wants you to be. And the only way that you can become the person that God wants you to be is if simply you seek the kingdom of God first and you seek his church first in your life. Our faith produces joy. Romans chapter 15 verse 13 says, The hope of God fills all with joy. Joy. Now, there's many people who look for joy in this life, but they look for joy in short-lived pursuits. You might find a short-lived joy in pleasure. You might find a short-lived joy in power. You might find a short-lived joy in wealth. You might find a short-lived joy in positions of influence. You might find a short-lived joy in lust, but you're never going to find an abiding joy in those things because abiding joy is only found in Christ Jesus. And perhaps you're here this evening and you're saying, well, I just don't have the joy that I used to have as a Christian. I'm just not feeling the way that I once felt. It could be because your faith isn't as strong as it used to be. It could be because you're not working out your faith in the way that you used to work it out. Faith is a source of joy. And if your life is leaking joy, it could be because your faith needs to be strengthened. But what's the only way that we can strengthen our faith? Well, we got to practice these nine Christian graces, the fruit of the Spirit, but it also comes in prayer. It also comes in Bible study. It also comes in working out your faith. And as we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes, it also comes in fellowship. All these ingredients take place in the recipe that produces a faithful Christian, someone who has great joy in their life. But you know, for obedience is a source of joy. Here's a joyful coincidence or a joyful theme that we find all throughout the New Testament that when a person puts off the old man of sin and puts on the new man of Christ to walk in the newness of life, they have a great joy. If you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 8, we find that man by the name of Philip. Philip was one of those men that was chosen back in Acts chapter 6 when the need arose in the church of Jerusalem to serve those Grecian widows. And he served those Grecian widows. But you know, Philip was also an inspired evangelist. And Philip, in Acts chapter 8, goes down to the land of Samaria. The Bible says that he preaches the Christ unto them. Men and women were baptized. Some people were healed. And then the Bible says... There was great joy in that city. Acts chapter 8, verse 8. Go down just a few verses to the conversion account of the Ethiopian eunuch. Here's a man, he's sitting in his chariot, he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And Philip comes and he overtakes this chariot. He begins to teach him what he has to do in order to be saved. And the eunuch obeys. He hears, he believes, he confesses, he's baptized. But in Acts chapter 8, verse 36, after all these things take place, and now he has put on the new man of Christ, the Bible says in verse 36, he went on his way rejoicing. 
He went on his way being joyful for the life that he now had in Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. We've already referenced this once before. But Paul, we know, went from Philippi to Thessalonica. And then outside, he preached to the Christ. He preached the Christ to these brethren. And after he preached to them, he wrote an epistle to them. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, he commended them for receiving the word with joy of the Spirit. Let me ask you this. Could there be a correlation to someone who is leaking joy in their life to someone who's also lacking in their obedience in their life? What's obedience? Obedience by its very definition according to Jesus is to keep his commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now we know that includes all commandments of Jesus because if we fell in one small point of the law, we're guilty of breaking the whole law. We must keep all the commands of Jesus. It might be things that we view as minimalistic. It might be things that we view as big things. But if your obedience is lacking, if your obedience is leaking, it may lead to a leak of joy. In your life. You know, sometimes I think we get caught up and we get so consumed with the Lord's church and with the work of the Lord when we've got certain things going on in our life, when we have children in the church, when we have grandchildren in the church, but then once those children or those grandchildren leave, a lot of times we leave our service to the Lord. You know that your purpose is much greater than your children, your purpose is much greater than your grandchildren in the Lord, your work is much greater than they are in the Lord. And it can't just be contingent upon them. If you're lacking obedience in your life, it's very possible that you will begin to leak joy in your life. But I also know that forgiveness is a source of joy. You probably can answer this question. Do you know who lacks joy in their life? Those who are sinners and those who live in sinfulness. I can't tell you how many people who have said to me, Zach, I just don't have joy I just don't feel that joy deep within me you know why because they're spiritually lost they say Zach I just don't have the joy that I used to have and they're a backsliding Christian if you know that you need forgiveness and you have yet to seek out that forgiveness do you know what that's going to cause in your life it's going to cause misery and we've got to understand this comparison that only joy can be found in seeking the forgiveness that only God can give but only misery can be found in spurning the forgiveness and refusing to go to the God that can forgive us and if you need forgiveness and you know it it's going to zap the joy right out of you Go with me to Psalm 32. Now, these are the words of David. And in Psalm 32, he begins to talk about this very concept of joy, forgiveness, and spurning forgiveness, which leads to misery. In fact, as you go down through this psalm, through the first 11 verses, you're going to see this theme pop out in the very passage. In verses 1 and 2, David says, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. Blessed, a state of delight, a state of happiness, a state of joy. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. Do you know what that means? Forgiveness equals joy. In verses 3 through 4, David says, When I kept silent, in other words, when I did not confess my sins to God the Father, my bones grew old. In other words, spurning forgiveness... Spurning confession equals misery in your life because you know you need forgiveness, but you've yet to take that step to go to God to receive that forgiveness. But notice verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you, and you forgave me. Some of the greatest relief that you will ever feel in your life as a New Testament Christian is going to God, confessing your sin. And that's an art in and of itself. Going to God, confessing your sin, confessing your trespasses to Him, and knowing that He is faithful and just to forgive you. Confession equals relief. But notice verses 10 and 11. He says, Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. If we're obedient, if we are forgiven, if we have not spurned seeking that forgiveness from the God who can only give that forgiveness, it's going to equal joy in our lives. 
If you have not the forgiveness that exists in Christ, then it's very possible the reason that you are leaking joy in your life is because you need to come before God, you need to seek that forgiveness, and you need to be forgiven. Because if you need to be forgiven and you're spurning that forgiveness, it's going to cause misery in your life. That joy that David speaks of, shout for joy, he who is upright in heart. That joy can only be found in the Lord. Fellowship is a source of joy. Now, would you agree with this? A lot of Christians are leaking joy in their life because they're neglecting the responsibility that they have to their brethren to participate in what we refer to as fellowship. Fellowship, by definition, meets at the cross. It's vertical, that is, between us and God, but it's also horizontal, that is, between us and our brethren. You don't have to go any farther in your Bibles than 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, when John said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, that is Christ, we have fellowship one with another, horizontal, and the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us of our sins. That's vertical fellowship. Fellowship is a key to feeling that joy that we have in our life. Now, joy cannot be found in earthly pleasure. But you see, fellowship, though it's earthly in nature, has a spiritual or heavenly context and a spiritual or heavenly goal. So even though fellowship is earthly in practice, it encourages us and builds us up spiritually and heavenly. And perhaps something that we've lost over the last couple of years is a love of fellowship. When people were separated from one another, when people weren't gathering together as we ought to gather together, when people were spurning attending worship services and attending other places where we had the opportunity to experience this great fellowship and the joy of fellowship, in those moments of time, that's when we begin to lose the love of fellowship, but that's also begin when we begin to forget what fellowship brings to our life as New Testament Christians. And when we start neglecting fellowship that's when our spiritual exuberance that rejoices in God and rejoices in his promises begins to wane some of you are like Paul you find great joy in seeing such fellowship in Philemon verse 7 Paul experienced joy by witnessing love and fellowship with Philemon he also found great joy in learning of the restoration of his brethren. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 7. Now let me ask you this. Do you find great joy in experiencing fellowship, whether it's with one of your brethren, whether it's with two of your brethren, or whether it's with multitudes of your brethren? Do you find great joy in seeing a brother restored back to Christ after they have left Christ to pursue a life of sin? Do we find that joy in the great Christian fellowship that we have as children of God? When's the last time that you felt that special joy from fellowship? Here's a fact. If you're neglecting the assembly, you can't have joy. If you're neglecting opportunities to gather together with God's people and fellowship with them, you can't have joy. If you're neglecting to serve God and work in the church with those who belong to God, you can't have joy. Christian life is so much more than just sitting in a pew and doing nothing. At the very core and the very foundation of the life that we have as New Testament Christians is a foundation of fellowship. And if we tear that foundation down, all that we have is a superficial and artificial relationship with one another that has no substance. And that's not based upon responsibility to God, but based upon perceived duty. Fellowship is a source of joy in our life. And if you're neglecting your brethren, if you're neglecting fellowship opportunities, if you're neglecting the work of the church, if you're neglecting the assembly, whatever you're neglecting that has to do with fellowship, if you're neglecting it, you're not going to have joy. But lastly, Christian service is a source of joy. I speak from experience. The greatest joy that a Christian can ever find is the joy in spreading the gospel by working together with your brethren toward that common purpose. And those who are willing to become involved in serving the Lord in that capacity, whether it's through teaching, whether it's through the giving of our time, is going to experience great joy from such service. 
I remember a fine Christian man who emanated joy that the Bible holds at high standard. That man's name was Barnabas. Barnabas was sent from Jerusalem to Antioch. The church there was growing. The news came to the ears of Jerusalem that they were growing. And so they sent for Barnabas to come down to them and encourage them. Acts chapter 11 verse 22. And when he came, what did Barnabas see? He saw the grace of God. And because he saw the grace of God, he was glad. On our recent door knocking campaign, the last one that we did, I had one of our members say to me, this stuff just makes you feel so good. It reminds me of the words of Jesus in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35 when Paul recounted those words and Jesus said, it is better to give than to receive. And if we possess the mindset that it's better to give than to receive, we're truly going to have joy. If it's better to give of our means than to receive more means, we're going to have joy. If it's better to give the greatest thing that we have to give, that being the gospel, we're going to receive joy. If we possess the mindset that it's better to give than to receive, one, we understand what Christian service is, but two, we also understand what joy is. Joy unimaginable. Because we're working together toward a common purpose with God's people. Faith is a source of joy. Obedience is a source of joy. Forgiveness is the very foundation of our joy. Fellowship is a source of joy. Christian service is a source of joy. All of these are sources of joy. And if you cut these sources off in your life, you can only expect your life to leak joy. Don't say, I don't have the joy that I used to have in being a Christian. I don't feel the way that I used to feel in being a Christian. I don't have the joy that I'm supposed to have in being a Christian. If your life is not filled to the brim with joy, there's a leak somewhere. And it's our responsibility as New Testament Christians to find the leak, to patch the leak, to repair the leak, and to once again be filled to the brim with the joy that can only be found in the Lord. If you want to inhabit the fruit of the Spirit in your life, you have to inhabit all nine of the Christian graces that are included within the text. That includes love. If I have not love, I'm clanging symbols. If I have not love, it doesn't matter if I have all the knowledge in the world, I know nothing. If I have not love, I am nothing. But if I have not joy, I cannot be the direct reflection of who I claim to walk with. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus, though he had every reason to be miserable, no one was more joyful than him. He was joyful when he was afflicted. He was joyful when he was persecuted. He was joyful when he was abandoned. He was joyful when he was betrayed. He was joyful in poverty. He was joyful in his ministry. He was joyful on the cross. He was joyful everywhere he went. And if we're not joyful everywhere we go, then we have a leak in our life. Joy, 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 joy. I got the joy deep down in my heart. Do you? If you're here tonight, you're not a child of God, you don't have joy. You may think that you have joy. You may be able to find joy in some things that are of the flesh, but that joy is only temporary, and it's not the abiding joy that we've discussed tonight. If you're here tonight and you're not a New Testament Christian, you have not joy, but the great opportunity that you have set before you, the great invitation that is now extended to you is an invitation of joy. You can be joyful in your life. You can have the joy that we've discussed tonight of goodness, of delight, of abiding happiness in Christ Jesus. All you have to do is be willing to be obedient to what God has commanded you to do. Do you want to have joy in your life? Make the decision tonight to become a New Testament Christian. Maybe you are a Christian, but you have sin in your life. Maybe you have something that you need to repent of. 
Maybe you're one of those people that we were talking about that's spurning forgiveness in their life. They're spurning confessing the sins that they have in their life. And because of it, it's bringing you down into misery. Remember, joy can only be found in the forgiveness that only God can give. And you have the opportunity tonight to find that forgiveness by asking for it.